Newsflash, people don't need to be told how to live their lives. In fact, societies don't need to be told how to function either. History and economics show that top-down commands are actually a pretty inefficient way to build peaceful, prosperous communities. A little something called emergent order is actually much better. Sloan, and today on Borderless, I'll be joined by Neil Chilson of Stand Together to break down what exactly Emergent Order is, why he wrote a book on it, and a whole lot of interesting stuff in between. But first, Sam Drewsbeck is with me here to talk about Atlas Network partner, the Lithuanian Free Market Institute, or LFMI, and how they have brought a little Emergent Order to their country. Sam, how are you, mate? I am very good, of course, Val. Nothing gets me more fired up than Emergent Order, so I'm I'm looking forward to this conversation today. Well, uh, Neil Chilson is also so much of a fan of Emergent Order that, as I said, he wrote a book on it, mate. So you're in good company on this episode of Borderless. Very good. Now, you know that my least favorite R word, Sam, is regulation. One of. One of. There, there is a longer list. We can cover that in another yeah, episode. But different show. Regulation is something that you and me have spoken of before, which, you know, Indeed. is obviously designed to help people in a perfect world and and you know government has a role in smart regulation but too often can be harmful especially when special interests groups who want to kind of game the system or get something out of it get involved in the process and then the regulation becomes more of a a weapon an impediment that that Mm -hmm. hurts people Mm -hmm. this was the case in lithuania sam The problem in Lithuania was that regulations on pharmacies in Lithuania would have raised costs or shut down businesses entirely had the kind of status quo or even proposed changes uh, been implemented. And that was a huge issue because uh, reality of life is we all get sick. And at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you have access to good pharmaceuticals, right? Yeah, it seems like an important uh, area of the economy to keep functioning well. Exactly. And in terms of, you know, economies function, well, we love the free market, right? And sure. at the end of the day, LFMI wanted to get rid of these kind of strangling regulations that were making it hard to just run a pharmacy in Lithuania. Mm-hmm. And they also wanted to, well, essentially reform the regulatory framework entirely to make sure that they could uh, strengthen the impact assessment of you know, what was actually being done, what regulation was working, what wasn't working. Rather than just fiddling around the edges, they wanted a wholesale look at how can the industry be regulated in a way that works for consumers, people who need pharmaceuticals, but also the pharmacies themselves. Yeah, that's very interesting. It often does take the work of uh, any organization, but typically Atlas Network partners are right in that slot of uh, coming in and telling the government, we get that your hearts are in the right place. Uh, These regulations are meant to help people, but um, we're just going to show you a few ways to actually get there um, and avoid some of these uh, unintended consequences that we see so often. Amen, Sam. And this, this this regulatory push uh, was something that they really grabbed the bull by the horns with mm-hmm. and got cracking on. In a testament to the impact that LFMI has, they met with the Prime Minister, they met with the uh, Parliamentary Speaker, they met with uh, the Minister of the Economy. These are really high-level meetings yeah. to not only explain the problems with regulations in the pharmaceutical industry, but explain how the market could handle it better. Not just that, they allied with business groups, government advisory panels, chambers of commerce, to get civil society actors and people engaged with the key stakeholders to come on board and say things aren't working and we've got to change for the better. A really important part of that too, Sam, Mm -hmm. was COVID-19. I mean, something we've all been living with and LFMI made a really compelling case that the regulations were just essentially making it hard for pharmacies to combat the the problems associated with COVID-19 because the operating environment was just so bloody difficult. Uh, so, Val, this is all well and good, um, and hopefully I don't stump you here, but can you go into a little bit about what those changes looked like? Of course, healthcare in general is something we talk about so much here in the United States, um, and it's always interesting to see how different uh, organizations and countries around the world tackle it. So yeah. what does that really look like on the ground for LFMI? Well, I'm glad you asked, Sam. The plan was a comprehensive systemic reform plan that they gave to the Lithuanian cabinet so that the government could evaluate it. But there were two key things that were really exciting to really benefit the average Lithuanian trying to get their hands on important medications. The first was that 
in-person supervision by a pharmacist in the pharmacy is no longer required for pharmacy technicians to dispense and sell medications. And you can see why that's really important, Sam, because in this age of social distancing, especially yeah. when COVID's at the height, the idea that a pharmacist couldn't dispense medications despite having all the information without being in person was a problem. Right. Not just that, though, Sam, they actually expanded patient choice, which is something we can definitely get behind, yeah. by allowing patients to choose medications rather than the government mandating that the cheapest option be the one the patient gets. Now, price is obviously a factor when it comes to right. pharmaceuticals and picking what you want and what you need, but for it to be mandated, it's very anti-consumer. If you wanted another medication, the, the cheapest option was required. So they did away with that and let people make up their own minds about you know what medications were prescribed and what they wanted to get. That's right for you. And I think that's really important. I think it's yeah. a good chance to allow people to have a key bit of ownership in their own healthcare journey Definitely. and get rid of things like the in-person requirement, which in, in 2021 with technology, with COVID, just wasn't making sense. It might make it a little more dangerous even. That's true. And a place is meant to be making you healthier. It doesn't seem exactly. like a great idea. Yeah. And what really stuck out to me, Val, is the model of that in them going to the government to work with this and that influencer model, uh, because you probably don't need to convince people that access to medical care is important, um, but you need to convince the legislators who are putting these regulations in place, hoping to improve lives to convince them, well, you might be harming people instead. Exactly, Sam. And the fact that these kind of changes that LFMI pushed in their plan mm -hmm. were accepted and adopted by the cabinet, it's just common sense policy to help yeah. people, help public health, particularly during a global pandemic, mm -hmm. is again a testament to good policy trumping politics. And at the end of the day, there were real world consequences that were hugely positive as a result of this work. It allowed 150 pharmacies to stay open, especially those in rural areas where access to pharmaceuticals was uh, less easy, and allowed yeah. 350 pharmacy techs to keep their job, which is great. I mean, especially yeah. with the economic slowdown during COVID and access to medication being more important than ever, some might say. That was the direct result of LFMI's yeah. plan being adopted. Yeah, that's very exciting to be able to look and see immediate results like that from knowing that, well, this would have been a different outcome without our intervention here. Exactly. And the thing we love about patient choice when it comes to pharmaceuticals and healthcare is, you know, drives down costs, it gives mm -hmm. people choice, it gives them ownership over their own decisions and healthcare. And that's something that we can really get behind, Sam. So I have to say, LFMI does a lot of impressive work, yeah. but it's hard to think of something more important than medical access during COVID. Mm -hmm. So I got to say, great work to that team getting the job done and making sure that good ideas could could trump bad regulation. Yeah, definitely always exciting to keep an eye on the Lithuanian Free Market Institute doing good work over there. I agree, mate. Mm -hmm. You know, as I, I flagged at the beginning, it's almost like this comes full circle. Emergent order is a really exciting concept. Yeah, I don't think we really defined it too much, so hopefully you will get into that in this interview. You know, we've got to keep <laughs> the good people waiting out there, mate. Right, because keep them on the edge of their seat. Neil Chilson is a really fascinating guy. Yeah. Emergent order is a really fascinating concept. Yeah. And whilst it might seem a bit academic, it certainly did to me when I was reading about it, it actually has huge real world implications. So I'm very excited to sit down with Neil and Sam. Thanks for coming on the show, mate. Yeah, always a pleasure. Neil Chilson is the Senior Research Fellow for Technology and Innovation at the Charles Koch Institute. He specializes in the economics of privacy, the study of innovation, and spontaneous order. His work regularly appears in media outlets like the Washington Post, USA Today, and Seattle Times. Neil's new book, Getting Out of Control, Emergent Leadership in a Complex World, builds on the work of classical liberal thinkers to make the case for the superiority of spontaneous order over planned economic models. Neil, how are you, mate? I'm Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. It's good to have you in person, you yeah. know? And especially talking about such an interesting issue. I'm, I've been very partial to CKI since I did my Coke internship program many yeah. years ago. And I know it's a, it's a real hot house for great thinkers like you to be able to dig into these ideas. Yeah. So, you know, it's been a crazy 18 months. But do you mind just filling us a bit in on, on what a day looks like for you and your work at CKI and the sort of research you're doing? Sure. So I, I have a hat at CKI as a senior research fellow in technology and innovation. And I have a similar role at Stand Together, which is the broader philanthropic community of thousands of individuals who are tackling some of the toughest problems that uh, the world faces. Um, my role is focused very much on technology and in innovation and the role that it plays in economic progress. We believe that technology 
Uh, market tested technology is the greatest producer of widespread human prosperity. And we think that it takes two things to um, get that type of technology, that type of uh, permissionless uh, innovation. That is a regulatory environment that allows it and a cultural environment that embraces innovation rather than fears it. Mm. And so my work is in both of those areas. I help uh, form our point of view on various tech policy issues, evangelize that point of view, and then um, also talk to uh, you know policymakers, help educate policymakers and the, the general public about the importance of innovation and how we can create the environments that produce it. I love that. Although there's not really much happening in the technology space, right? No, it's no, 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 yeah, yeah. It's it's so quiet. It's sleepy. You know, my yeah. day, my days are my days are just empty calendar days. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear, I hear. <laughs> but seriously, I, I mean, I'm I'm kind of a bit jealous of your job. That's a, that's really interesting field to be able to sink your teeth into and talk about. Um, I really like how you talked about that, that kind of almost two-pronged approach, though. Mm -hmm. of, it's not just the laws and the regulations. It's actually building a culture that embraces this idea of permissionless innovation, that embraces the idea that advances in technology coming up spontaneously through ingenuity are a good thing. We don't have to be scared of them. Right. You know, I can't imagine that um, everybody thinks that way, which is why it's really interesting to talk about emergent order. So when, we, when we're talking about emergent order, what, what is it? And how is it different from, say, top-down central planning? So emergent order is the idea that you can have patterns uh, that serve in complex systems that serve the needs of the system, the purpose of the system, without any one participant in the system being in control of uh, the system. So this is very common in the biological world. So if you think of something like an anthill or uh, a beehive, you know, there's there's a queen ant and a queen bee, but they don't really control anything. The the ants themselves are following very simple rules, but the result is something that's very complicated. You know, beehives um, air condition themselves essentially, and they can migrate to new places when there's resources. And it's there's no one ant or bee that makes that decision. They they happen. So the great example I have that uh, sort of con contrasts this with like command and control is think about a uh, sporting event, uh, uh, you know, a football game or a baseball game. You're at this game and there's a, uh, everybody gets a placard and at some time they like hold it up and it says go team or whatever. That's, that's planned, um, order. Yes. You have somebody who designed that, who told everybody exactly when to raise them all, mm -hmm. coordinated it. They understand the whole system. Everybody has a role, but the role is uh, is understood by the person who designed it. Yes. Now compare that with something like the wave at a baseball game, mm -hmm. uh, where some people try to get it started. Sometimes they succeed, sometimes they fail. It's funny either way. <laughs> um, uh, but when it gets going, it's not any under any one person's control. Even the people who started it don't really control the wave anymore. It, it happens because people are deciding based on their own personal preferences and their own heuristic in their head. Yeah. You know, Am I excited? Am I uh, tired? Am I <laughs> bored? Do yeah. I have food in my lap? Right? Uh, is something interesting? happening in the game uh, and so but you can see the pattern right mm -hmm. even though there's it's every individual is making its their own decision you can see a pattern that's complicated yes uh, that's the coordination of thousands of people doing something together that's why it's so satisfying when it works mm -hmm. um but it's also like falls apart. Like f uh, f you can't really predict when it falls apart even right. often. And so uh, that's an example of emergent order. Mm. Uh, people acting under these simple rules that they have individually, but the collective uh, result is something that's complicated that couldn't that is not under any one person's control. You know, I really love uh, your examples. I have to salute you for that because you know when we're throwing around phrases like emergent order or command and control, you know. Not not everybody knows what that means, or even if they do, knowing in a tactile sense. But I I can picture myself sitting in that stadium down the road here, yeah. thinking about how satisfying it is that dopamine hit when yeah. the wave works. You know, yeah. you're part of the wave. But and hey, you know, my dad back in Sydney is a beekeeper, so I can certainly appreciate <laughs> the emergent order of that. Um, and I, and I guess I, as a total layman myself, there's something beautiful about that because you can be part of it and you can almost implicitly understand the rules without somebody, as you say, having to be like, at this time, do this thing in this way and it'll all work, you know? Yeah, some of the most satisfying experiences that we have as humans, I think, are ones in which we're participating as individuals of our own free will without being commanded. Mm -hmm. But the purpose and the result is something that's much bigger than us. And, uh, you know, 
to be honest, um, I think it, even the most individualist person would have to acknowledge that it's hard to get big things done in this world without other people. Yeah. And if you want to do something big that's successful, that has a big impact, you're going to have to bring people along. You have to persuade them. And uh, and these processes of emergent order, uh, being able to understand that uh, and the benefits of emergent order over command and control, I think can help us lead people uh, better than if we are trying to just do command and control. And that's in all areas of life, public policy yeah. as well as personal life. No, I think it's a really important point you raise, especially because one of the most uh, frustrating to me charges that gets leveled at, you know, classic liberals or people who love things like emergent order is, you know, well, you just care about the individual. And it's like, no, we, we care about people, communities, like society. How we get to those results is very different from how the central planners want to get to those results. But as you say, you know, we need others. We need people to get things done yeah but it can be done in a way that is not necessarily coercive or top down and planned and in a way that is often inefficient and sclerotic yeah you know? absolutely so that brings us to obviously a really crux point of this which is what is the advantages of emergent order over say central planning because history is obviously replete with examples of central planners thinking they know everything and especially in this day and age you know, technology a field you're obviously very familiar with yeah. don't we have enough technology now enough advancement to be able to plan everything out to the nth degree, or is it a little more complicated? Than yeah, that? yeah. So it's a uh, it's a lot more complicated <laughs> than that. Um, uh, you know, the the basic advantage. There are a couple advantages that uh, decentralized uh, emergent order systems tend to have over centralized. Uh, planned systems. And the biggest one is something that Hayek called the knowledge problem. Mm. Um, decentralized organizations uh, tend to help solve the problems that are nearest to the people because it captures the, it basically empowers the individuals or the lower levels in the system to uh, address the problems that they are seeing sure. without having to relay all that information up to a centralized a planner who's going to make decisions about how uh, someone far away is going to live their life. Um, you might think that that knowledge problem gets solved if you can somehow improve the communications between the lower level and the higher level, but uh, that's not really the case. I have a great example in my book, uh, General McCallis, uh, sorry, McChrystal, um, when he was fighting uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, ran into this exact problem. Um, communications on the battlefield made it possible for you know a special forces team to relay every single decision up the chain um, to McChrystal and. You know, it, it was very, as he describes in the book, it was very, his book, uh, Team of Teams, it was very satisfying to him to be able to, you know, uh, make the decision, yeah. right, as the leader. Uh, <laughs> and But he quickly realized that Al-Qaeda in Iraq was so decentralized that they were just the, outpacing the biggest military in the world mm -hmm. because they were not trying to centralize the control. And so what he realized uh, very quickly is that he needed to empower the people in the field and that technology was actually kind of getting in the way of that because it was theoretically possible for him to weigh in on every decision. Didn't mean that he had more capacity to do so. He yeah. was or that he had information to contribute that was useful. And so he was often just rubber stamping thousands of decisions and being a bottleneck in uh, in his team's work. And so, uh, so no, uh, in centralized communications, even like the new technologies that we have, they don't really solve the knowledge problem. Yeah, I love hearing you explain that because it's hard to think that me being able to put a phone call straight into the White House will necessarily make the DC metros run on time. You know, like you could hope, but you know, <laughs> uh, to your point, you know, just because we seem to have all these whiz bang great solutions, as impressive as they are, doesn't necessarily mean we can crack the knowledge problem. And at the end of the day, these uh, emergent orders are a way to, uh, you know, at least allow those people where the rubber's hitting the road, problems are coming up, living their lives, whatever it may be can be empowered and that's that's very humanizing i think in, yeah. in a lot of ways we talk about systems so i think it's kind of uh, interesting when we talk about these concepts to bring it down to that human level and, and what do you think it means for us as people emergent order how can we you know kind of understand and embrace what that means for us in our day-to-day -day lives so uh, as individuals i talk about this in the the last third of the the book um emergent order has a lot to say to us i mean i think 
just recognizing the human tendency to grasp for control when we see something that's complex, um, like as the world is increasingly complex and complicated, mm -hmm. and we're starting to uh, realize that from you know our ability to get information from all around the world very quickly, yes. we're inundated with all of this information, and it feels like things are out of control. Mm -hmm. um, I think as individuals, understanding that that is not a reason to either grasp for control yourself or to um, look to someone else, mm -hmm. a politician or, you know, a CEO to like yeah. solve these problems for you. That uh, putting them in control is in many cases no better and, and sometimes much worse sure. uh, than, than trying to tackle some of the individual problems that you see yourself. One of the things that the um, uh, technology certainly doesn't solve is the ability to uh, where people see different problems in the same situation. So mm -hmm. uh, if you centralize decision-making, you're going to get solutions to the problem that the centralized decision-maker sees, mm -hmm. which may be very different from the problems that you and I see day to day. So, yeah. so for individuals, I think um, getting this gut-level understanding uh, of emergent order, this idea that there can be order without control um, can play out in our individual lives in uh, two important ways, I think. One is understanding that we ourselves as uh, biological, complicated entities, we are examples of emergent order. Uh, mm -hmm. Our bodies are complex systems that while it seems like we control them, there's many things that happen that are emergent processes. You know, the pizza that I eat that turns into you know, bone or muscle or fat, usually fat in my case, uh, will, is not, um, under our control really. Yeah. And so, so understanding that, uh, that it's still orderly and we can influence it, mm -hmm. even if we can't control it, I think is really important. And what that means for us, I think, uh, if we can really get a gut level understanding of that is that we should seek to develop habits and constraints on our own behaviors that help us, um, be more mindful of the decisions that we make. That is that is an area in which we do exercise control. Yeah, I can decide my reactions to things. Mm -hmm. It's a very limited area in which I have quite a lot of control. Um, most other places in our lives, we we have influence, sometimes very strong influence, but we don't ha really have uh, control. So if I can maximize my ability to use that decision making that I have. Um, to set habits for the complex systems that are my body or that are my family or that are my community, mm -hmm. um, I can help shape those, uh, those complex systems and, and improve them uh, even though I don't have control. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I think it's a really powerful point where, of course, we can speak to the, the policy implications about not appreciating emergent order, as you say, giving it to some politician or bureaucrat to solve it for us, not necessarily the best outcome. But there there is a very much a, a self-discipline and self-understanding that can come from this when, as you say, you know, I would love it if I ate a slice of pizza and could tell it to give me rippling <laughs> biceps, but I don't have that level of control. But but, you know, understanding especially the reactions that we have to other people or our choices in life or the ways we interact uh, or whether or not to eat that pizza in the first place, right. it all comes back to, as you say, you know, exercising that level of, you know, influence as opposed to just um, expecting there to be some command and control that we can exercise on ourselves, let alone society and the most complicated matters out there. Right. So, you know, being able to discuss all this Let's talk about the book. What what led you to actually write a book on emergent order? Did you just decide one day it's time I put this down in writing and get the good word out there, or what kind of inspired you? Yeah, so uh, you know I've been thinking about emergent order since I I was a teenager. I came across a book called uh, Chaos by James Gleick. It's like mm -hmm. a pop science book around the study of chaos, which what he was talking about in that book we would now call complexity science, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I got very interested in these ideas just uh, from a sort of scientific point of view when I was, when I was a kid. Uh, and, and I continued to pursue that in, uh, in uh, computer science undergrad and grad school. Um, but when I went to law school, I didn't really see like tight correlations between it. I was still like really interested in that as a science issue sure. and, and how cool it was that you could have really complicated results from some very simple rules in, in computer programs and that nature was full of this 
Uh, I, I found that fascinating still. Um, but when I started working as a lawyer, I, I qu quickly realized that uh, over and over you would see in government policymaking, especially somebody saying, hey, I got these rules, these rules, we're going to or we have this regulation or this law, we're going to pass it and it's going to it's going to fix things. <laughs> and I uh, totally convinced that that was true every single time, even yeah. though. You know, I, I spent a lot of time working with the Federal Communications Commission, mm -hmm. and they'd always come up with this complicated scheme uh, to fix the side effects of the previous complicated scheme. And it quickly, I, I quickly started to connect, uh, you know, the emergent order, mm -hmm. spontaneous order concept with policymaking and say, like, these people are trying to. They're trying to constrain. They're trying to control a complex system, and that only ever results in two outcomes. One is that. Um, there's a bunch of unintended consequences you didn't expect. Maybe you are okay with that if you're, you know, you don't care about certain uses of the system as a as a politician. But the other one is that your rules sort of work, but what they do is they take all the complexity out of the system, mm -hmm. right? They turn a complex system that serves many needs into a simple system that serves essentially the regulator's needs, mm -hmm. and that's neither of those outcomes is great. Um, and so thinking about that uh, and seeing how people, as the world continues to get more complex, I think, or even if it doesn't get more complex than it was in the past, we're certainly more aware of it because we can get information from all over the world instantaneously. Yeah. So we can see terrible things or complicated things that are happening far away. Um, and that makes people feel out of control. And so the reason I wanted to write this book was to say, hey, you're right. You're <laughs> you aren't in control, um, but that doesn't mean uh, the idea should be to put somebody else in control or to assert control yourself. That that's a recipe for stress in your own personal life as you fail to gain control of this complex system, and it's a uh, you know it can be a terrible disaster on the policy level. I mean, some yeah. of the worst um, tyrants of, of history were trying to take and impose their will, their control on a complex system with terrible results. And so um, part, you know, the reason I wrote the book was to help people get more comfortable with this idea uh, of emergent order to get to see that there's an alternative to control. And that that alternative doesn't mean to do nothing, but it means to focus on the things that you can do yeah. with great effect, uh, which are largely focusing inward on, on your own choices mm -hmm. and then working to build the institutions to contribute to the institutions that can help um, organize uh, society, but not in a way that's under any one person's control. Yeah, I really love that because um, far from being kind of hopeless, like, yes, you aren't in control of everything in the world. It actually seems very empowering because yeah. you can say, acknowledge that and deal with what you can handle as part of that emergent order, you know, what you can influence. And I guess I, it kind of strikes me, Neil, as, as do you think there's a a fear factor involved here you know is there something human that makes us want to control everything and that's why we can be so susceptible to just pointing to a politician and saying they'll fix all our problems or you know is, is that why it's yeah. so important to make people comfortable that you don't have to control everything and that's okay yeah i, I there really is i mean i i think just historically sort of biologically you know for most of history humans lived in small groups mm -hmm. uh, where everybody around them had a similar life experience. And so when you had that sort of tribal uh, structure to society, um, it was it made it actually made more it might have made some sense to have a sort of executive who has mm -hmm. who has a very similar set of experiences and probably has your interests at, at, at heart sure. uh, and, and sees very similar problems that you have. The knowledge problem is much smaller mm -hmm. because they're dealing with the same problem you are largely. Um, and so I think instinctually we are sort of built to hand control over to an authority in many ways and that – uh, you know, it's been the classical liberal tradition that has said, hey, there's a role for uh, authority in society, but we need to put constraints on that as the world gets more complicated, as we're interacting with people who don't have similar life experiences to us, as we're interacting with people who don't have, don't see the same problems in the world and don't want to solve the same things. And so, um, uh, I do think that getting that idea of emergent order, uh, which I think runs as a thread through a lot of classical liberalism uh, and economics, 
um, making people more comfortable with that will help them resist this tribal instinct to hand control over to somebody else uh, or to seize control themselves. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more because I, I just don't think it's a message that has been out there enough that there is an alternative because there's always someone willing to take that authority, pass that law, pass that regulation, tell you what to do. Empowering people to take control of what they can influence is a really exciting message to me. Pivoting a little bit here, Neil, I'd love to hear a bit about how your work on emergent order but also in the technology space has, has intersected and, and how do those two really play off each other or complement each other in the work that you're doing at CKI and Stand Together. Yeah, so I, I talked a little bit about my interaction with uh, the FCC. Yeah. I spent some time at the Federal Trade Commission, which is a very different agency in many ways, and worked on antitrust and um, privacy issues and other technology issues that uh, uh, the FTC deals with. And brought those issues, those are a lot of the issues that I work on now, uh, antitrust, privacy, content moderation. And in all of those technology issues, you see um, both of these paradigms, right? You see a paradigm that says, well, we need somebody in control of this complex problem to set the rules and put them in place. And sometimes that's coming from politicians who are saying this, and mm -hmm. sometimes it's coming from the companies themselves. Sometimes the companies themselves are begging the politicians to set rules because they would like the clarity. Yeah. Um, uh, and they would like to not have to try to solve this problem. <laughs> but uh, what what they're often talking about, especially in the speech context, is a complex emergent system that if you simplify, if you could put a speech code in place online that was comprehensive and you could enforce that comprehensively, you would be eliminating uh, much of the value of these platforms because okay. uh, because conversation would be so stilted <laughs> and under these very specific today? rules. This exactly. is the name of my cat. Exactly. Yeah. It'd be like a fill in the blank sort of social media. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and and uh, I think a lot of the benefits that come out of a robust uh, structure for discussion of complicated issues would be lost. And so um, – so I, I kind of bring that emergent order mindset to my work. Um, and I think about it in the way and also structurally in, in government. You know, when you have government agencies who are trying to deal with something, the two models that exist are sort of the FCC regulatory rulemaking model and the more FTC enforcement sort of common law model. Mm -hmm. And those have distinct advantages and disadvantages to both of them. But I'm pretty partial to the uh, the FTC's model when it comes to fast moving technology because, um, unlike unlike the regulatory model, the knowledge problem is much less. So the knowledge problem in general is much more exacerbated in fast moving technologies, right? Because not only is the information dispersed and often tacit and irreducible, it also changes very quickly. And so cool. even if even if somehow the regulator could get all the knowledge necessary to make a decision, it's out of date by the time they pass a, yeah. a rule. Um, so in that space, it's often better to set goals for what, what harms you're trying to prevent and then bring enforcement actions after the fact. Com much more the tort common law approach mm -hmm. um, that, you know, there's a long tradition in the Anglo-American uh, uh, yeah. and Anglo uh, society. So, um, yeah, so those are just some of the different ways that I bring this emergent order work into my and to the policy work that I do at Stand Together, thinking about how to deal with some of these big challenges in technology, but in a way that preserves the their benefits uh, and creates an environment in which the next disruptive technology can come about and, um, you know. Uh, help improve our lives. Yeah, I mean, the the scope for more and more fast moving and disruptive technology seems to shrink the more we try and put rules and regulations and and stifle it all. I guess I'm curious, Neil, to to see if you're an optimist or not when it comes to emergent order. In so far as, do you think we are just going to see uh, a time and time again a playing out of people trying to control everything, and it's going to be a constant battle, or do you think there is space for more people to understand the value of emergent order, both in our own lives, but in a public policy sense? Yeah. So um, that's a great question. I, I think I, I, I'm certainly an optimist, uh, generally good, speaking. we like optimists on Borderless, <laughs> so that's good to hear. But, uh. Uh, I'm an optimist generally. Um, uh, I think – and I'm not – I'm not – these things don't happen by themselves, right? The environment for 
market tested innovation that benefits us is not inevitable. Mm -hmm. Um, Human history shows that. I mean, we, you know, uh, I think uh, Deidre McCloskey talks about how for most of human history, the average person lived on $3 a day uh, in today's dollars. And that somewhere around 200 years ago, that started to just spike upward. And that was a result of technology and cultural trends that were not inevitable or they would have happened, you know, in Egypt or in Rome. Um, There was something different about that time. And a lot of it was the ideas. And I think one of the key ideas is this idea of spontaneous order, emergent order, decentralizing uh, effects. And it ties in very closely with the rights of the individual um, vis-a-vis the state. And I think because when an individual has the freedom and the right to act, uh, that's when they can do something creative. And that's when emergent, the interactions between individuals can create these types of emergent order um, that could never be designed from the top down. And so, um, so I do think that understanding this concept is crucial to the continued uh, innovation that I think will uh, continue to make human life better on this planet. Um, but it's not inevitable. That's why I wrote the book. I want to help people um, yeah. as a society, as a complex system, um, you know that it's there's a lot of momentum, right? Yeah. And so it's not as if at any point this is going to come grinding to a halt. I, I don't believe that. And so in that sense, it can feel sort of inevitable that the system will continue uh, to innovate and that uh, the U.S. will continue to be uh, an engine of entrepreneurship. Um, but it can erode over time. And it's important to continually try to build the infrastructure and the institutions Uh, the intellectual infrastructure and the institutions that can continue to allow innovation to happen. And so this is my small contribution to that, uh, that effort. I mean, what you've just said is, is critically important. It's easy to think these things just happen by themselves. You know, I had the great fortune of being born in Australia, living and working in the United States, you know, so much material wealth around me and it's fantastic, but these things don't just happen as right. you say. And, and indeed the, the state of humanity has been far from where we are now. So protecting these ideas, understanding how emergent order can underpin so much of it is exciting from like a historical perspective but also a very ambitious optimistic view ahead yeah neil how can we get our hands on your book and stay on top of what you're doing yeah so uh the book is available on amazon on all the platforms that you might uh you might look for it um uh I have a Substack. It's substack.com slash out of control. You can also follow me on Twitter at Neil underscore Chilson. Um, those are most of the places you can get a hold of me. My, my organization, Stand Together, standtogether.org, is a great place to go uh, if you're a social entrepreneur who's looking for uh, the potential to partner with somebody who can bring uh, resources and management uh, training to help you maximize the impact that you can have in the world. Um, and and hopefully this book will help. Uh, if you're one of those people, hopefully this book will help you uh, be a uh, uh, leader who embraces the emergent order mindset. Absolutely. You know, and it's why we at Atlas Network love Stand Together and indeed, you know, our similar model of working with people around the world, uh, not in a centralized way, but right. in a way to support their efforts to unleash entrepreneurship, human ingenuity and live their best lives without Absolutely. having to, you know, control people and control the whole system. <laughs> Neil, it has just been a delight to sit down and talk to you about Emergent Order and understand not just more about this, this concept, but really it's very practical implications in day-to-day life, not just the policy realm. So thank you so much for coming on Borderless. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here.